ਸੰਜਨਾ ਜਸੋਰ ਨੰਦਨਾ ਬ੍ਰਜ ਜਨ ਰਾਂਜਨਾ ਜਾਮੁਨਾ ਤੀਰਾ ਬਨ ਚਾਰੀ ਜਾਮੁਨਾ ਤੀਰਾ ਬਨ ਚਾਰੀ ਜਾਇਓ ਰਾਧਮ ਮਾਧਵ ਕੁੰਜਾ ਬਿਹਾਰੀ ਗੋਪੀਨਾਨ ਬਾਲ ਬਾਗਿਰੀ ਵਾਰ ਧਾਰੀ ਜਸੋਦ ਨੰਦਨ ਬ੍ਰਜ ਜਨ ਰਾਂਜਨ ਜਾਮੁਨਾ ਤੀਰਾ ਬਨ ਚਾਰੀ ਜਾਇਓ ਰਾਧਾ ਮਾਧਵ ਕੁੰਜਾ ਬਿਹਾਰੀ जायो राध माधव कुंज बिहारी हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जयो प्रभु परा प्रभु परा प्रभु परा शील प्रभु परा प्रभु परा प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय जय प्रभु पाद ਜਾਮਿਸ਼ਨੂ ਪਾਰ ਬ੍ਰਹਮੰਸ ਪਰਿਵਰਾਜ ਕਚਰਿ ਸਦਰ ਸਤ ਸੀ ਸੀ ਮਾਤਿ ਰਣਿਕ ਸਾਮਜੀ ਵਾਂਗ ਰੇਸ ਸ਼ੀਲ ਏ ਸੀ ਭਗਤ ਵਦੰਤ ਸਵਾਮੀ ਰਾਜ ਸ਼ੀਲ ਪ੍ਰਭਾਰ ਕੀ ਗ੍ਰੰਥਰ ਸ਼ੀਮਰ ਭਗਵਤਮ ਕੀ ਅਨੰਤ ਕੁਤੀ ਵੈਸ਼ਨਵ ਰਿੰਦ ਕੀ ਸੀ ਸੀ ਰਾਰ ਗੋਪੀਨਾਥ ਕੀ 
Nitai Ghor Pramanandi. Augur is some devotees, Augur is some devotees, Augur is some devotees, Augur is Augur is Sisi Guru Guranga. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Reading from Shima Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 16th chapter, text number 43. Chapter is entitled, The Lord's Opulence. Yovai Manasis... I need my glasses for this. Yovai Van Manasi Samyag... Yo vai van manasi samyag Asamyach chandiya yatihi Asamyach chandiya yatihi Tasya vratam tapodanam Tasya vratam tapodanam Shravatyama gatam buvat Shravatyama gatam buvat Yovaivan manasi samyag Asamyach chandiyayatihi Tasya vartang tapodanam Shravatyama gatam buvat Ladies, Yaha, <coughs> one who, vai, certainly, vak manasi, <coughs> the speech and mind, samyak, completely, asamyachchan, not controlling, dhya, by intelligence, yatihi, a transcendentalist, tasya, his, Bhartam, vows, tapaha, austerities, danam, charity, shravati, run out, ama, unbaked, gata, in a pot, ambuvat, like water. Translation and purport. Can you move this? Can you move the board? Can somebody move the board, please? A transcendentalist who does not completely control his words and mind by superior intelligence, 
will find that his spiritual vows, austerities, and charity flow away, just as water flows out of an unbaked clay pot. Purport. When a clay pot is properly baked, it holds any liquid substance without leakage. If a clay pot is not properly baked, however, water or any other liquid within it will seep out and be lost. Similarly, a transcendentalist who does not control his speech and mind will find that his spiritual discipline and austerity gradually seep away and are lost. Dana or charity, refers to work performed for the welfare of others. Those who are trying to give the highest charity by preaching Krishna consciousness should not engage in speaking cleverly for the satisfaction of beautiful women, nor should they attempt to become artificially intellectual simply for the sake of mundane academic prestige. One should not even think of intimate sexual relationships, nor should one daydream of acquiring a prestigious position. Otherwise, one's determination to strictly practice Krishna consciousness will be lost, as described here. One must control the mind, senses, and speech by higher intelligence so that one's life will be successful. Yovaivan manasi samyaga samyat shandiyayati tasya vratam tapodanam sarvatyam agatam bhuvat. A transcendentalist who does not completely control his words and mind by superior intelligence will find that his spiritual vows, austerities, and charity flow away, just as water flows out of an unbaked clay pot. O Magyanati Marandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chetanna Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhotale Svayam Ropagadam Hayam Dadati Svapadantikam Sri Krishna Chetanna Prabhunitananda Siyadvaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Mukam Karutiva, Chalam Pangum Langai Tegrim, Yat Kripadam Maham Vande, Sri Guru Dinataranam, Paramananda Madhavam, Si Chitani Shwaram, Vanchakal Patrubhyascha, Kripasundubhyevacha, Patita Nam Pavanebhyo, Vaishnavibhyo, Namo Namaha. Hare Krishna. With the blessings of all the Vaishnavas. Here in this section we are hearing about the Lord's opulences. This is Vibhuti Yoga in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter. Yad yad vibhuti mat satvam srimat urjitam evava tatta eva tagachatvam mamate jom jasambhavan. Whenever you see something beautiful, this verse should come to your mind. We shouldn't think, oh how nice, I want this. We should think, oh, how wonderful is Krishna. He has made this. This is his vibhuti. This is his potency, his beauty. Do we ever think like that? Or do we think, no, 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 no. This is a chance for my own satisfaction. So Krishna's beauties are unlimited. His opulences, his strength, his fame, he's Bhagawan. He possesses everything in the utmost degree, including renunciation. So Krishna's opulences are being also described here to Uddhava, who is another dear friend and confident, intimate associate of Krishna. Krishna is telling Arjuna that I'm speaking to you this confidential knowledge because you are a dear friend and you are non-envious of me. Anasuyave. Friendship requires that envy is absent, otherwise there's no real friendship. Mm -hmm. You cannot be friends with somebody and be envious of him at the same time. Because it's contrary, it's a contrary rasa, it does not mix. So, <coughs> Uddhava was on such intimate terms with Krishna that Krishna sent him to Vrindavan to bring the message to the inhabitants of Braja, including the gopis and his relatives, his parents, his friends. That is very intimate 
type of service. So Uddhava had that confidential privilege because he knew Krishna's heart and Krishna knew that he could trust him. Therefore here Krishna is revealing himself fully. You only reveal yourself to somebody you can trust, to somebody who is not envious of you, to somebody who wants your own true welfare and well-being. So Uddhava, being such a dear friend, was fortunate that Krishna manifested his opulences to him. And after giving an entire array of opulences, here in the last section of this chapter, this is the second to last verse, Krishna is repeating in four verses practically the same message over and over again. You may have noticed, you know, it's about control your mind, control your speech. Huh? It's very interesting. Why is, he re why is he stating this four times? This shows that in didactics, repetition is a key element in order to impress a certain point upon the audience. Repetition is a key element in order to impress certain points upon the audience. Repetition is a key element in order to impress certain points upon the audience. If you also build in the proper pauses and you make it more dramatic, it actually has more emphasis, more impact. That is the art of delivery. But that requires, again, control of the mind and control of the speech faculty. Because if the mind and the speech faculty are not controlled, sometimes, like you see in small children, they just come up to you and go, Aah! Have you ever seen? Have we ever done like that? But when you're about four years old, your parents, they expect you to make words and sentences, right? Otherwise, they look at you and they say, this is not my kid. I don't know this. I don't know this fellow here. Because my kid speaks, you know, in sentences. So, a transcendentalist who does not completely control his words and mind by superior intelligence will find that his spiritual vows, austerity, and charity flow away just as water flows out of an unbaked clay pot. We heard yesterday in the beautiful class Rupa Goswami's verse from Upadishamrita Vacha Vegam Manasakroda Vegam Jiva Vegam Udarupasta Vegam was quoted <clears throat> where this faculty of the tongue to vibrate, uh, and the tongue to eat also is mentioned. How can we control our words? It is very easy to proclaim to be spiritually advanced till somebody bumps into you, somebody takes your plate of prasadam, somebody steps on your toes, or what to speak of, somebody offends you. <clears throat> or what's the worst of them all? What is worse than all of these together? What is the opposite of love? It's not hate. It's indifference. If somebody ignores you. They just behave as if you do not exist. Has this ever happened to you? Or is it just me? Now you may have gotten so used to it that you think, okay, everybody's in their own mind and headspace and they're all just absorbed in Krishna's service. But if we're truly Krishna conscious, that means we're conscious of Krishna's parts and parcels also. And we know how to relate with each and every individual in a Krishna conscious way which means we are conscious that Krishna is in the heart of this living entity 
and that I have a relationship with Krishna and therefore I have a relationship also with this living entity. And upeksha or neglect or indifference is utilized according to Bhagavad Gita for whom? Upeksha? Who should we neglect? Is it Gita or Bhagavatam? Envious people. Yes. Only for the envious. So when you are neglecting somebody, it immediately means this person must be envious. This person must be hostile. This person must be an enemy. Otherwise, why would I neglect him? Why would I avoid him? Which shows that we cannot be indifferent or neglectful to devotees. <clears throat> Just like in a relationship, whether it be husband and wife or family or friends. If fighting is there, it's not so bad. Because fighting means, yeah, I care for this person, you know. There is something at stake. There is something valuable to protect. That's why I'm fighting. That's why I'm investing my energy because I want this relationship to work. But if there is indifference, if there is neglect, ooh, that's bad. When somebody says, we're not talking, I don't know that person. That's bad. That's very bad. So as devotees, we should make sure that we do not fall into this trap of becoming indifferent or neglectful of other living entities, what to speak of other devotees just because we're too much caught up in our own mind and in our own affairs. Uh, so when somebody neglects us, it hurts. And somebody offends us or attacks us with words, that's less harsh. That's not so difficult. At least they're giving us some attention. It is stated that there's many people who practice spiritual paths, and some of them are very austere. Some of them are very dedicated to their practice. But oftentimes, because of being neglectful of Krishna and his devotees, they drown in small puddles of anger. This is another didactical method, the use of analogies. What is the analogy in this verse that's being used? Pot. What kind of pot? Unbaked clay pot. That looks very nice, but it cannot contain any liquid. Why? Because it's unbaked. Huh? Very illustrative. In a similar way, you can drown in small puddles of anger. When we're not careful to direct our faculties, to direct our emotions, to direct our ability of speech, our ability of the mind, which means feeling, emotions. If we do not control them by that superior intelligence, that intelligence which is Krishna conscious intelligence, if we fail to do so, then they will captivate us, as we have heard from authorities, and they will drag us again into the mundane realm. Now sometimes we see transcendentalists also using indifference, but they're doing so in a way that it benefits others. I met one man in San Francisco in Haight-Ashbury. He said, I met this person, Prabhupada, in New York in the early 60s. He came to the storefront and the devotees brought him up to Prabhupada's room. And he said it was mystical. It was perfect. The Swamiji was sitting there on the floor and I sat down in front of him and he didn't say anything. 
and I didn't say anything. And for 40 minutes, there was silence. But I knew that he knew that I knew. You get the idea. <laughs> And after 40 minutes, Prabhupada told one of his assistants, give him some prasad, and he left. And he said it was the perfect meeting. After 50 years, he met me on Haight Ashbury and he got a book of Prabhupada. Because he was too proud, he was not able to listen to Prabhupada. So Prabhupada did not speak to him 50 years ago. But then, 50 years later, Prabhupada is still patient. The teacher is patient. Prabhupada is ready to speak to him whenever he is ready to hear. So we may be here in the temple, minding our own business, being very good at what we do, or not so good at what we do. But unless we have appetite, unless we have hunger for this message of the Srimad Bhagavatam, unless we have appreciation of Krishna's devotees, unless we have taste for chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And unless we have a strong desire to share this message with others, our cup will remain unbaked. And whatever we pour into it, it will seep out. Some drops, some fragrance will remain, but not much. Not much substance will be there. So how do I bake my cup? Well, you have to put it into the fire of Sankirtan. That is the fire where the cup will get baked. And our small cup will increase, our capacity will increase. The amount of hearing and chanting, the amount of association, the amount of service will increase. They are, again, in Vedic didactics, here in this shloka, the negative is stated in order to emphasize, emphasize the positive. Because if you just say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, sometimes people don't hear you anymore. But then the Shastra also says, oh, watch out for this. Don't do that. If you do this, this will happen. And the negative is reinforcing the positive. So that's what Krishna is doing right here in this verse to Uddhav. And the last verse will then sum it up in a conclusive, positive, very strong message. So in the purport, the commentators are telling us what we should avoid. We should not try to speak cleverly for the satisfaction of beautiful women. Now we may ask ourselves, why do they put us in here? Can this be a problem? Can this be a, an issue, a pitfall? Huh? Yes, it can. Otherwise, why would Rupa Goswami list in his Upadeshamrita huh, that this is one of the things that will destroy, huh? they will destroy bhakti. Atyahara prayasas ja prajalponiya magraha janasangas chalolyam cha Sakdir bhaktir vinashiti. Huh? We'll destroy bhakti. If we associate with people who are engaged in materialistic affairs or who are attached to such kind of people and we take on their qualities, their desires, their ambitions, it will be contrary to our practice of devotional service. Hmm? Same in Shikshastakam, Nadhanam, Nadjanam, Nasundarim. Kavitam va jagadisha kamaye mamajan manijan manishure bhavatat bhakti rahoi tuki tvai. So these pointers are being given to us because these are real issues. Sometimes we may find ourselves trying to speak cleverly, to say something cute, to say something funny, to say something 
just in order to get the attention and appreciation of someone else. And that is not permissible for sadhus or persons who are pursuing the spiritual path because it will weaken our bhakti, our devotional service. Nor artificial intellectuality of speaking big words, mumbo-jumbo, just making up big constructs of long words for being known as a scholar or an intellectual type of a personality. What to speak of thinking of intimate relationships huh? or daydream about acquiring prestigious position. Now we may ask ourselves, why is it that sometimes I have a hard time relating to other people? Has it ever happened to you that sometimes you had a hard time relating to other people? It can happen, right? Not just because there's too many of those people, but more often it is because the noise in our head is too loud. The self-talk is too dominant. Our false ego is bombarding us continuously with self-talk telling us you are this, you are that, you are the other thing. You fill in the blanks. Now it does not matter whether that self-talk is of the inflated uh, variety or of the deflated variety. You know, there's dry stool and wet stool. Both will end up in the fire, uh, being burned. So, whether we have an inflated false ego or we have a deflated false ego, both of them will obstruct us from being able to have relationships with other living entities or with Krishna. Has it ever happened that you're in front of Krishna, but you can't see Krishna because there's so much noise going on in our own head? Has it ever happened to you? Or is it just me? Huh? Sometimes you're like, what did Krishna wear today? Oh, there was a lot going on, you know? There's a lot going on in my life right now, right? It's a busy time. Hmm? If we want to relate to other living entities, then having a superiority or an inferiority complex is a very, very detrimental type of a mindset. When Srila Prabhupada came to the West to share Krishna consciousness, Many people remembered him that the Swamiji was one of us. Rock Scully, the leader of the Hells Angels in San Francisco, he said, they were neighbors, he said, the Swamiji, he was one of us. He was a heavy guy. Because he heard the kirtan, he heard the, the programs that were going on. And they know this is heavy. This is like serious business. So I know this is serious. The hippies, they thought Prabhupada is one of us. He was older than their grandparents. They thought he's one of us. The scholars, the intellectuals, they thought he's one of us. The common people, he th they thought he's one of us. So nowadays you might think, oh, I don't go to the West, I don't deal with Westerners. Well, we got news for you. Bombay is more Western than the West. You don't have to go anywhere. You can just go here on, you know, Marine Drive, Chow Putty Beach, or you go to Lover's Lane, you know, near, Sky, near Skylink. Huh? This place is more Western than the West. Because in the West, they don't believe in this stuff anymore, you know. <laughs> Have you heard of postmodernism? Modernism, you know, what's modern is in, is what people want. Postmodernism, they're way past that stage. That's, that's gone, you know. Going to the movies and getting some cheap thrills and, you know, buying some ice cream. That's, it's all gone. All the isms are gone. It's just about me and my own satisfaction. 
So whether our mind is busy chanting our glories or whether the mind is busy telling us how low and how useless and how wretched we are, both these tendencies will block us from having a relationship, from having an actual communication with the person that we are encountering. So it will actually inhibit us, it will thwart our endeavor to show mercy. Because Dhanam charity can only happen if we get out of our own heads and we realize I have something valuable and I have a mission to give that valuable object to someone else. We may not realize that we have something valuable because we grew up with it or because we're culturally conditioned to think this is just the way how it is. When Lord Chaitanya met Sridhar, one time he said, Sridhar, you're a great cheater. You're the wealthiest person. You're just hiding your wealth. You're a capitalist. And Sridhar had no food, no proper clothes, no proper dwelling place. But Mahaprabhu said, just wait, very soon I will expose you. You're the richest person in the world. A heart filled with bhakti, with devotion, is true wealth because it attracts Krishna. And Krishna, who is Madhava, the husband of the goddess of fortune, he fulfills the desires of all his devotees. So if you have devotion, you have everything. And if there is no devotion, there is nothing. So a devotee is a true capitalist. Otherwise, our determination to strictly practice Krishna consciousness will be lost. One must control the mind, senses, and speech by higher intelligence so that one's life will be successful. Indriyani paranyahur indriyabhya paramanaha manasastu parobudir yobude paratastu saha. Bhagavad Gita gives us very clear, very concise the build up, how it all works. So if we study Bhagavad Gita daily, and we reflect on how does this apply to my life, we will become more aware of the workings of this universe and will become more capable of dealing with people in a proper way. All throughout this chapter, Krishna has spoken about how to control the mind and how to control the faculty of speech. Again in the Gita, Krishna speaks about speech. Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat. He's saying we should only speak what is truthful, what is pleasing, and non-offensive to others. And it should be related to Vedic literatures. In this way, this is the austerity of speech. The austerity of the mind is also given. So we don't have to speculate. We don't have to go search and look for these answers. Krishna is giving us these answers. Prabhupada is giving us these answers. To have the simplicity and the alacrity of mind to accept these answers and to apply them in our own lives is the prerogative of the simple and sincere devotee. Hmm? There is a saying that if you have one year time, you grow rice. If you have 10 years time, you grow coconuts. And if you have 100 years time, you grow people. Prabhupada, he gave us these books because he wanted to have impact and affect the entire world for the next 10,000 years. So this shows to us the vision the mindset of Srila Prabhupada. 
who perfectly imbibed all these qualities. This is Acharya. And by taking shelter of this process and taking shelter of the devotees who practice, who have applied themselves to this process, we can also avail ourselves of these qualities. I remember initially I was coming here to Radha Gopinath Mandir because of the food. Uh, downstairs there was a place, f unlimited paratas. Now as a brahmachari, that's a pretty good deal. Huh? Unlimited paratas. Hard to beat. Hard to pass up. And after a while I realized there's some other people there too, besides, you know, Radha Krishna Prabhu and his good wife. And I started making friends. And I came back because there were some good friends, and including Maharaj, Shilaradnath Swami. Mm -hmm. And this friendship has kept me coming here because a friend is a person who knows how to control his faculties in order to do good for the other person. Hmm? To say what is usually not being said, but it's required to say it for the benefit of that person. Or sometimes to be quiet. Because knowing that that person will not be able to handle and take it or appreciate it. That is a true friend. Mm -hmm. So, one of these friends is one of the original doctors of uh, Radha Gopinath Mandir and Bhaktivedanta Hospital. His birthday is today. Uh -huh. So I come to meet these friends. And I will continue to come here because of seeing the intensity of devotion and absorption in devotional service. In the same 11th canto, the example is given of the arrow maker, who is making an arrow for the king. Meanwhile, the king is passing by on the road with a lot of pomp, a lot of animals, a lot of noise and music, and the arrow maker does not even notice. So sometimes, when somebody shows you indifference, it might not be directed towards you, but it's because they're intensely absorbed in their devotional service. But if you're in the guest department, or you're not intensely absorbed in something, you should pay attention to the guest. In fact, it is stated that if there's only the pujari and he's doing artik and the guest walks in the door, he should walk off the altar, receive the guest, make sure the guest is happy, and then continue the arti. Why? Because this is Krishna's guest. Krishna is not bothered. His arti will go on. He wants his guest to be served and taken care of nicely. So... In order for friendship to thrive, we need equality. Now we know equality is sounding a very, as a very modern concept, a very liberal concept, and it's not appealing, because factually speaking, we know there's hardly anything equal in this world. Even if you look, like none of these fingers are the same, right? They're all fingers, but they're not equal. They're all of different sizes, lengths, and you know, abilities, and strengths. But because they're equal in purpose, they're equal in their idea, in their desire, if they combine together, they can do pretty good things. Mm -hmm. So in a similar way, in our friendships, there has to be an underlying element of equality. Mm -hmm. There has to be appreciation and service attitude. But if equality is not there, if one person is always trying to assert their superiority 
or one person is always trying to assert their inferiority, then the friendship will not be very strong. It will not be very tight. Just like Krishna and his cower boyfriends in Vrindavan. Some of them are older and they have a protective mood. They always want to look out for Krishna's welfare. They want to make sure he's fine. They guard the area. They look out for trouble. They, they're always in this mood of protecting Krishna. They're friends, but they're older friends. And Krishna has his peers who think themselves equal to him. And they have all these talks uh, and competitions and challenges uh, and fights. And then there's the juniors who come and they serve and they bring things and they massage and they, they sing and they fan and they do all the menial tasks. But they're all friends. And as such, there is equality. Why? Because there is unity of purpose. And as soon as we bring in personal agenda... Just like, who was it, Vatsasura? That demon who took the form of a calf? Huh? Another one took the form of a cower boy. Which one was that one? Pralambasura, yeah. Both of them immediately stood out. Why? Because they had ulterior motive. They had personal agenda. And immediately, red light alert, right? Everybody could see, ah, here's the, here's the rascal. <laughs> they immediately saw, even though they looked like a calf and like a coward boy. Hmm? So, because we're not always so in tune with Krishna, the Lord in the heart, we need the feedback of our friends to help us to refine our motives, to align ourselves with the mission of Guru and Krishna. Hmm? Krishna says in the Gita, Bhaktaram Yakita Pasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatva Mam Shanti Rikshati. If you want Shanti, you want peace. You have to know these three things. Krishna is the proprietor, Krishna is the enjoyer of everything. He's the proprietor of everything, he's the enjoyer of everything, and he is the Surit, the well wishing friend of all living entities. He's such a friend that he will never leave us. Super soul is always there throughout all the species, throughout all the situations. It's pretty good. Have you ever had a friend who left you? It happens, right? Or they do stupid stuff and then we think, oh, okay, another one bites the dust. All right. Short list just got shorter. Huh? Not many left. So... But Krishna, he's the Surit. He is always acting for our eternal well-being. That is Surit. Huh? So if we're aware of this fact, we will never be disappointed. We will never feel a lacking. We will never feel inadequate or lonely or frustrated. Because Krishna is right there. He's there in our heart. He's, he can guide us. He can give us all the direction, all the inspiration, all the strength that is required in order to proceed forward, in order to succeed in our devotional service. Mm -hmm. And he has given here these beautiful words uh, in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So let us not become depressed or feeling inferior or feeling ourselves very glorious and grand because it can inhibit us from dealing adequately huh? with living entity that require Krishna's mercy. One time Srila Prabhupada was traveling, and his servant was Hari Kesh Prabhu, so they were traveling very rapidly. They were in a place where there was no proper kitchen, no proper cooking arrangement, just one little gas burner, those portable 
stoves, or no, it was an electric, an electric plate, a hot plate. And Prabhupada wanted hot chapatis for his lunch. So, servant Harikeshi brought the chapatis, and they were not so great. They didn't puff up. They were not like here. I always tell my friends, you know, I'm eating chapatis in chopati. I know for you it's not very, you know, spectacular. But in the West, if you get hot chapatis that are well done, that are puffed up, it means you made it, you know? Like, you've got it down. You've got it figured out. <laughs> so, so Prabhupada said, he just rejected it. He looked at it, he took one look, and he just rejected it. He just said, and after two or three of those came, he, he said, what's wrong with you? And he, because this is love. When somebody loves you, they can point something out, and they, can, they may attack you. And Harikesh said, hot plate, and you know, nobody can make a chapati that puffs up here. Prabhupada got up from eating lunch. He said, nobody can make a chapati. Washed his hand, walked into the kitchen, took one ball of dough, rolled it a few times each side, put it on the plate, turned it around, and poof, it puffed up. He took it with the thongs, he threw it in the face of Harikesh, and he walked out. <laughs> and the servant was blissful. Because when the servant gets chastised by the master, he realizes, this relationship is tight. This person loves me. This person loves me so much, he does things that normally you do not do to anybody. But because the relationship is so thick, Nothing can break that relationship. One time I was traveling with Srila Radhanath Maharaj, and in different occasions, <clears throat> he was teasing me, and he's telling me, you know that Prabhupada, he never spoke about book distribution in New Vrindavan. You know, he spoke about cows, he spoke about deity worship, he spoke about Varnashram. He never spoke about book distribution. And then he looked, if I, if I react, you know, if I pick up on it. <laughs> and I was just smiling, happy, you know, like, yeah, 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 of course, of course, yeah, wonderful, great, you know. So, and sometimes you may feel intense separation. And you're doing your service and you think, oh, my Gurudev, he's not here. But as Prabhupada was saying, my guru, he never left me. He's always looking over my shoulders, right there, guiding every step. We just had Puri Yatra, and there was a lot of devotees. And some of you have been there. And, you know, you're in the back, and you see your guru is a small figure there on the stage. And you hear Kata, and you think, oh, this is all very nice. But, but you know, like the gopis in Kurukshetra, you know. Same Krishna, but not the right place, not the right situation, not the right atmosphere. I don't feel the love. So I was feeling a little rejected. So I just walked on, on Puri, on the ocean road, going towards Swargadwar. And then a car stopped next to me, and the window opened, and Shilaran Maharaj said, Where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going wherever you are going. That's, that's where I want to go. He said, okay, get in. If that's the case, then get in. But no talking. No talking, only japa. Huh? So I got in, and for four hours we went to all this last day of Yatra. We went to all the different places. Huh? And we went to Gambira for 40 minutes. We're down in the cave chanting. And... And I realized that we're never separate from our spiritual master. So it is not a matter of physical proximity. Srila Prabhupada says that devotional service is the most congenial form of intimacy. Bhakti, devotional service, is the most congenial form of intimacy. It's not about physical proximity. 
It's not about geographical location. It's about how much absorption and how much intensity of desire do we have to imbibe and serve the mood and mission of our spiritual master. Which means sharing this message of Srimad Bhagavatam with everyone, regardless of caste, creed, color, or other extraneous circumstances. Everybody thought, Prabhupada, he's my friend. Because there was a relationship. There was real care. There was real friendship. Mm -hmm. There was real love. I want you to flourish. I want you to succeed. I want you to achieve the best that you can possibly achieve, which is Krishna's mercy. I want you to get Krishna's mercy. If we truly desire that, then with one drop of the compassion of Lord Nityananda, with one drop of the compassion of Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual masters, the previous acharyas, that one drop can drown not just us, not just the person, but they can drown the whole universe. One drop. Or we can drown in small puddles of anger or in our own little fishbowl of insecurity or superiority imagined, cooked up in our own minds. The choice is ours. The Bhagavatam is giving us all these options so we can make an informed choice. But for the devotees who have tasted a fraction of that drop, it's really rhetorical. There are no options, so to speak. Because all there is, is Krishna in his different aspects. <laughs> you cannot avoid him, no matter how fast you run, and no matter how hard we try. Wherever you might go on the planet, Krishna is already there. So... These are some reflections on this verse. Thank you for being such an attentive audience and holding up the flag here in this beacon of light of Krishna consciousness. It is much appreciated. And we look forward to coming here again and again to meet our friends and to appreciate all the arrow makers who are working diligently in their little workshops. <laughs> to hone their skills in order to please Sri Sri Radha Gopinath and the Parampara. Grantarat Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Nitai Gaur Premanandi.